I'm Cosette, and today we're going over some A push prep. Um, we're do gonna do a Q and A. We're also going through practice questions from units one through five. So if anytime, feel free to chime in as we're doing these practice questions. Um, if that's not anything else, we could just get started right away, right? Yeah, let's get into it. All right. So we're going over unit one, which will be interactions in North America, 1491 to 1607. Um, a lot of people ask like questions about this part because some people just like push it off to the side the same way like people do unit 12, but we're not exact. We're not there, no, not unit 12, unit nine, but we're not exactly there yet. Um, <laughs> oh, well, my point, okay. What my point is, is that a lot of people just try to push it off, brush it off to the side. It's still a very important part of the exam. And I remember getting like an SAQ, yeah, SAQ on it when my first time taking the exam. So we're, I'm going to go through the questions and the answers and we'll try to figure it out as we go. First off, uh, what role did African slaves play within the social hierarchy of the Spanish colonial system? When you think social hierarchy in Spanish colonial system, you have to think of the, what was it, the encomienda system. Am I correct? Yes, yeah, so it was the encomienda system with the na with Native Americans, um, enslaved Native Americans, uh, uh, the, the Spaniards, and also there was a mixed population that was within them. This is not a level of power. They did not. Held positions of political power do the same thing, and being regarded as, regarded as equals because of religious teachings. Um, I could see why people would think that, because you have this phrase religious teachings that was kind of true but they weren't regarded as equals they just had to spread the religion because that was a part of their um what would you call it that was that was a part of their a uh, socialization colonization mindset so the answer would be they occupied the lowest tier because they were uh well first it was native americans but like the african slaves they were exported for labor and suffered suffered racial discrimination that placed them at the bottom of the social pyramid Next question. Uh, oh, okay. Um, what cultural movement significantly influenced African American art, music, and literature, art, and music during the mid 20th century? I thought we were just gonna go over unit one. I'll just go ahead and answer this one. It was the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, Is there a way to make it just unit one? Or, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Let me just refresh the tab. Okay. Okay, we're back. We're back on business. So what exchange led to significant changes in the old and new worlds during European colonization? Um, when we're saying that I think it's li it's literally in the text. Now, you could say the Protestant Reformation. No, that's not between old and new. Um, it's, it's pretty obvious what the answer is. It literally says exchange. It is the Columbian exchange. While uh, they all did have significant um they had like significant impacts on world history. The Columbian exchange directly impacted changes in the old and new worlds because it connected them both. Um, the transatlantic slave trade, you could have said that, but because it said exchange. Ooh, oh my God, okay. What, who composed the primary source Mort's relation detailing the Pilgrim's early years in Plymouth col colony? So we're thinking about here, um, we're thinking here, when we're talking about, we're thinking about Plymouth Colony, which was one of the first colonies, first successful colonies, I should say, because there was Roanoke. Uh, if we want to go through all of the, if we want to go through all of these, Roger Williams, John Smith, Captain John Smith, I don't want to use Pocahontas as an example. Let's not use Pocahontas as an example, but he was one of the found it was one of the first settlers of these colonies there was winslow and bradford if oh uh, let's see if i can remember i think they had to do with um uh, maryland possibly no 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 that was that was the first woman uh oh there's only one person here do you think hi one person do you think you could solve this part <laughs> solve this question i know i'm sorry to put you on the spot just in case you like went to go get dinner and just completely just turned on the stream and just let me talk. 
put it in the chat. Also, uh, Winslow and Bradford, I think, were pilgrims. I don't know specifically what good they did, but I know they're like notable pilgrims, and I think Massachusetts could be wrong. Ooh, that, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. I was like, when you said like the, I forget which location you said, but I was like, oh, it sparked my memory. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Oh, you're not in a push. Well, welcome to the stream. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot then. <laughs> this question might have confused you. It, it confuses me a little bit too, because um, Mort's relation was not something I studied, but just by, uh, just by what do you call it? Process of process of elimination. I'm pretty sure it's Edward Winslow. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay, because they were um, they're both co-authors, but they uh, wrote the the one of the first accounts of the Pilgrims' like early experiences in Plymouth Colony, which was M.A. I think so. I believe so. Now this one. Oh, oh, what could the answer possibly be? Even oh, if you're not an A push, maybe put it in the chat. I think you, you could know. You could give a little guess. Mm -hmm. Because the crops, <laughs> we have to think about the cash crops here, um, especially when we're thinking about the South. There's only one cash crop that's on here. I oh, we actually do. Is. We actually do. Uh, what was? Do we do AP Lang? I know I'm doing AP Lit. I know yeah. I'm doing AP Lit. We're, we're doing all of them, I think. I don't know what days they are though. I think the schedule is like online somewhere. So. And I so think like if you have any other crams. Yeah. <laughs> All the APs basically have a cram review. So check in nightly guys. All right. This is not one unit one to five, but let's, let's just go through it. Which act was significant for extending voting rights to African-Americans during the civil rights movement? Now let's put on our critical thinking caps here. Civil rights, like there's really only one of these that were active during the civil rights movement. Let's put it in chat. Let's see what you got. These are these are medium questions. I kind of want to I kind of want to bump it up to hard. I want to I want to put a flame under these three people's feet. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it after this question. Hi Stella, welcome. We're answering questions right now. Anyone who just joined, so put your answers in the chat. Good practice. Ew, go on once, uh, go on twice. Not even giving you time. It was Voting Rights in nineteen Voting Rights Act nineteen sixty five. Mind now, we could talk about hey, why was it just until nineteen sixty five? Did we codify our rights in the law? Don't worry, <laughs> don't worry about that. Apparently, don't worry about that. Hard. Ooh, level hard. Okay. Mm. What was the primary purpose behind the Spanish explorers' establishments of missions? In California. This one's hard. <laughs> what was the primary? Let's put our critical thinking caps on here. When you think of Spanish explorers, okay, you could, they wouldn't be trying to provide the Native Americans literally anything. When we think of Spanish explorers during this time period, uh, you think of colonization and you think of, you could think of, not what's the, it's not reformation. It's the act of trying to, conversion, conversion. Uh, and they wouldn't be, and to offer refuge in those escaping religious persecution in Europe, that's more of the, um, that's more of the pilgrims in Plymouth colony. Uh, so when we're thinking, when we're thinking about the main, um, the main purpose behind, com uh, not conversion, uh, Spanish colonization, it wasn't necessarily to convert Christ indigenous peoples, not only because they were Catholic, they weren't trying to convert them to Christianity, they were Catholic, let's get that in our heads. But that was more of the justification that they did afterwards. So the correct answer would be for, oh! <laughs> uh, my fault. The Spanish established missions as part of their strategy to convert indigenous peoples to Christianity. Okay. That adds up. Oh, actually, Actually, I understand why I understand that why that is correct. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Let's talk about why I'm wrong. <laughs> Dreadfully so. Ooh, Kosek, could you chime in there? Like a little bit? Oh, I'm yeah. reeling from that. <laughs> are you 
forgot the question. That now that oh, is was the what was Spanish the Spanish um what was the main reason for co Spanish colonization? Oh yeah. I think what I remember from this class and like what my teacher ingrained into my brain is like the main reason there's like sub reasons so you kind of have to rank each reason on a hierarchy and although expansion was somewhat fueled on like resources expanding territory power control and everything the main reason for the spanish in this specific area was due to their just religious momentum that they've been getting already and then then also want to, to expand like even more so and so while like resources and stuff is going to be like a feasible answer because yes they did want that i think like in this kind of question is like which is like the main which is the best i think it's best for when you think of like spanish x like this empire's expansion and colonization i would always really link it back to religion just because i think after like the first couple that was like their main like motivator and in going into new areas for a while because they were trying to compete Okay, thank you. Yeah. Ooh, this one, this one, this question also got me a little, got me a little scared under my collar because, as every A push student does, I didn't really focus on the Native American tribes. They, you do that at the beginning of the year, and then you never hear about them till what the 1960s. It's like they never existed. But <laughs> you don't hear about them until cowboys in the 1960s. Crazy. <laughs> so true. But um. Oh, Kose, oh, were you talking there? Sorry, I don't want, oh. don't want to bolt those of you. Oh, no, I was just going to say. Also, I see we have some more viewers. Yay. Uh, for those who are new, just put your answers in the chat, and we're going to talk about these practice questions. And So, yeah, make sure you put your answers in the chat. If you yes, please, please, because <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we could even get to a little argument here <laughs> about which answer might be the right one. Oh, uh, how did Eastern Woodlands cultures differ from Western Coast tribes in terms of social organization? First, uh, I'm going to go through all the answers and we'll see how and we'll like try to work through our process here, because even now uh, I I'm even now I'm drawing a bit of a blank, but that's OK. Well, on the test, you will draw you, on the test. You will draw blanks. But often what the AP test does is the they will put they will put context within the answers and there will always be. There'll be a right one and then a best right one. That's usually how the questions, uh, sorry, how the answers are structured. So please don't be, I mean, be, be worried, but don't be too worried. Um, so all Eastern Woodlands tribes were nomadic while Western Coast tribes established permanent settlements. Hmm. Let's think about that. Eastern Woodlands tribes, so that would be, not the Iroquois, would it be the Iroquois? Um, Eastern Woodlands tribes. I think that is like the Iroquois. It yeah. was. I was right. So that would be like the um, Iroquois, the the Cherokee, and the Shawnee tribes. The so that would be all in the all the woods. So if I'm looking at a map of America, it's not Cal. It's not like Cali, but it's uh, to the east. Um, and they were nomadic, while the Western Coast tribes established permanent settle settlements. Uh, there's also the second question, second, oh, are we getting anything in chat? No. Okay. The Western tribes developed no form of societal organization. Now we can just X all that out because all Native American tribes, all of them had a co complex, complex and sophisticated level of not only government organization, but societal organization. Uh, it wasn't as strict and as oppressive, I would say, as the as as we get into like European settlement and colonization and their level of uh, and how they separated people into castes essentially but off the bat that's wrong ooh matrilineal i'm pretty sure that is ooh define matrilineal for me oh oh <laughs> mama I, I was going to guess the first one but that Eastern Woodlands tribes trended to matrilineal systems while Western Coast tribes developed chiefly societies with complex hierarchies. Okay. Now that is a word I'm not familiar with. <laughs> I'm also not familiar with that word, but from what I recall, I'm pretty sure the Eastern Woodlands tribe, instead of having like 
the like uh, what we know and and like Native American uh, organizations that they have like chiefdoms, like the chief holds the power and then that kind of hierarchy. It was more kind of like, um, I'm not sure how to put this into the best words, but they're like, like a council kind of situation. So it wasn't just like one chief representing kind of the whole tribe. It was more of there's different like subgroups and different leaders to make this like council. Oh, okay. So it would be in matrilineal systems, the lineage and heritage are, uh, it's like, not like, a, it's like a kingship, like the way we think of how kings pass down their lineage. It's like that, but it's passed down with the women, that their children are part of their group. So it's more, more like the leadership is based on, like, what is this? From, I don't want to misspeak here. More like, not tribal familial connections if i'm correct yeah very lineage based oh okay this one might not be too hard but which was a dominant form of the spanish what was which, which was a dominant form of labor in the spanish colonial system primarily used to advance mining and agriculture uh, uh, okay i'm gonna try to see if we can get anybody in chat to answer Yes, someone in chat. Put your it's fun to engage. Put your answers in the chat. Don't be afraid to be wrong either. We're wrong too, and that's a learning experience. Oh, Adam. Adam spoke in the chat. Let's go. Um, he said D. I'm I'm right by using he, right? I hope I am. Sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry if I'm overstepping. <laughs> uh thank you for putting the answer in the chat, Adam. That was amazing. Encomienda system. Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm too excited for somebody talking about encomienda system, but it was the primary form of labor in the Spanish colonies. They were indigenous peoples. It's not like our, the, it was European. It wasn't like the um, haciendas. It's not like the hacienda system where we had enslaved Africans, um, where they were both forced into hard labor in the fields under brutal conditions. It's just that when we're, when we're talking about the enslaved labor of Africans, we're specifically talking about the triangular trade uh, and the Middle Passage. Just to make sure we have that distinction in our heads as we go through. Oh, again, I was a Hamilton fan. So I, I know that that's probably exuding off of me, but which uh, factor contributed significantly to the American Revolution? There's, there's only one right answer. This question isn't that hard. It's not that hard. Um, Compared to the other ones labeled under hard. This yeah, <laughs> like they have this sweat in a little bit. <laughs> uh, Adam, uh, can you put in the chat again? Do we have anyone wanting to put this in the chat? Thank you. Thank you. It was yeah. A. It was A. I think after this question, we can go on to unit two so we can talk because I think this would be a nice segue to um, talk about the American Revolution and whatnot. Oh, mercantilism. So how did mercantilism contribute to Europe's desire for exploration and colonization? First one, by promoting economic competition between nations through acquisition of wealth and resources from their colonies. That's the first one, stressing self-sufficiency within individual co co countries without relying on colonies for resources. The third one is advocating for a peaceful coexistence by rather than colonial expansion as a means to gain wealth by encouraging free trade between countries that restrictions or tariffs. I can tell you first firsthand, um, C, is, C is incorrect because colonial expansion was like one of the main points of it uh one of them was for glory god and gold <laughs> so thank you adam for saying a that it did emphasize the importance of nation's wealth through the accumulation of metals and resources through colonial conquest and exploitation and now we can go on to unit two I'm glory god and gold and i'm virgin your company okay this would be talking about colonial so colonial society and on our way to the American war. I'm sorry, the sorry, this American Revolution and uh, the Enlightenment and the American Revolution. 
So which event marked an important shift in British colonial relations leading up to the war for independence? Let's see some answers in the chat. Yeah, MVP Adam, let's see. <laughs> Oh yeah, these are hard questions. Good job, everyone. Our level right now is hard, so. Yeah, I, there's a part of me, there's a little a little part of me, like the little little lizard brain in my head that's I'm like, gonna, let's turn it up to extremely hard. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I saw one of the hard questions and they were asking me about um, Marxism <laughs> and through a Marxist lens. So, <laughs> you know. Do we have ask, a little bit? Oh, do we have any? Who is our one viewer? What would you like to see? Hard, extremely hard, medium, easy? Are they here? The hills are silent with the sounds of nothing. Ooh. Let's do hard. Okay, we're gonna stay with okay, hard. Okay, we're on hard. We'll do this. Do you want to turn it up? Do you think we should? I think we should simmer it up a little bit, or just so just so we're extra prepared because. We ooh, actually, talk about talk about to detail. You know. I I personally don't be all right. So the event that marked the port and shift would be, uh, in British colonial relations. Um, uh, it would be the end of solitary neglect following the French and Indian War because then. And salutary neglect was more like it was like the British colony said, do what you want. We don't care. But after the war, they needed money. So they started milking the colonists for whatever they're worth. And by that point, the colonists had already developed a sense of independence. Uh, like we're seeing the beginnings of an American identity with liberty and independence and freedom to do what we freedom to do what we want. So once we started getting that power encroached upon us, that's when we started seeing some friction between uh, the colonies and Britain. All right, let's pump it up, pump it up. Oh, are we sure that's unit two? I suppose. So how did uh, Pocahontas's interactions with the English settlers affect Native American and settler relations in Virginia long-term? Mm. So first, first we have for A, her actions led to an alliance between the Powhat Powhatan, Powhatan tribe and the English settlers that held over held strong over centuries. And two, the marriage to John Rolfe ended all conflicts between Native Americans and Native American settlers permanently. I'm just gonna go right off the bat. That was not true. Not true. Oh, C. Let's see. Oh, Adam, <laughs> you're killing it, <laughs> Adam. You're killing it here. So it bolstered peace between our lifetime. It didn't fundamentally alter like the hostilities between Native Americans and European colonists in the long run, but for a while, it it had it had an effect of peace. All right, next question. Yes, see. Sorry, refreshing my page a little bit just so we're staying on the on the right track. What would have been a likely outcome if the Brent British had won the French and Indian War? Ooh, 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 that's ooh. a little spicy one. Actually, has anybody ever actually thought about that? It was it was something that was not really discussed more more like it is it is worthy worthy to explore. Ooh, we could move to unit four. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Do you, and make sure if you have any questions on any particular topic in unit four, we will do our best to answer it. Sure. Or if you want to go over any unit, just like put it in the chat. Oh, you mean A for this question? I think that was for last question. Okay. So, Sojourner Truth and her famous Ain't I a Woman, uh, Ain't I, in her famous speech, Ain't I a Woman, what lasting effect did it have on the women's suffrage movement? Oh, DBQ? Oh, don't worry. About, I'm not going to never say don't worry about DBQs, but I could go over some tips for uh, to answer those if you'd like. You could it do a DBQ review. 
Oh, a DBQ review. Thank you. Ugh, I love it when history mentions intersectionality for once, because for a large part of the feminist movement, a large part of, I mean, when we're thinking about how history books paint it, like black women were not really um, like to the forefront of the movement. And that's probably due to the issues of intersectionality. Next question. How did Napoleon's decision to sell the Louisiana territory to the United States in 1803 impact Southern society? A, uh, it created economic recession in the South as funds were diverted through territorial purchase. Um, B, it spurred Western expansion, leading to an increased demand for enslaved labor, and then, es and then it led to escalating sectional tensions. C, it led to the immediate abolition of slavery across state, Southern states through the French influence. Or D, it caused a large influx of French uh, immigrants into Southern states, altering its cultural dynamics drastically. It was B that um, because the Louisiana Purchase is oft is like a major turning point in um, the American history because it resulted not only the it, it resulted in increased demand for enslaved labor enslaved labor sorry for cultivating cotton which was a new which was a cash crop that was ultimately catapulted be catapulted because of Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin and then it already intensified existing North and South differences and divides over extending slavery into new territories. And going through with this, it caused a lot of issues that ultimately will snowball into this civil war. Next question. Oh, how did queer identities interact with societal expectations during the South and early Republic era? Oh, Cosette, for a minute, can I go get water while you read off the yeah. answers? No worries. Okay, I love this question. Again, I love talking about the different marginalized groups in history. So, option A, they were celebrated through public festivals and parades. B, queer identities held political power, often securing high-ranking positions within government bodies. C, queer spaces were widely available as community support centers across the southern states, and D, they were suppressed due to strong religious beliefs and stringent moral codes. So I don't have access to the screen, but Adam, I think you're 100% correct again. Sadly, during this time, um, queer identities weren't really thought well upon. There was a lot of discrimination towards queer identities, especially if you get into intersectionality that just amplified the discrimination that these people face. So yes, sadly, they were suppressed and it was a sad time for any queer identities but yeah just knowing this time there was a lot of discrimination for like all marginalized groups all right thank you for holding out the fort i love it um so how did frederick Douglass's autobiography contribute to his audience's understanding of slavery i own frederick Douglass's autobiography i think it's required reading for anyone it's very beautifully written um anyway <laughs> a tangent. So A, he offered solutions for peaceful coexistence between slaves and masters. Um, his vivid, f B, his vivid firsthand accounts expose readers to the brutality and inhumanity of slavery. Um, C, his, his book outlined legal arguments against slaveholding laws. Or D, he provided a statistical analysis on slave mortality rates. Uh, you said B, could be C. All right, let's narrow it down. Uh, Frederick Douglass wasn't necessarily a lawyer and he didn't really outlaw, I don't think he really uh, had legal arguments. So let's go with B because, because his narrative was personal and it, de uh, and it recounted the brutality and the inhumanity of, of enslavement. Uh, it, really, it really spurred on many Northerners to join abolitionist movements. So you, your, first, or your first thinking that it was B was correct. Mm. So, next question. How is President President Monroe's purpose behind issuing Monroe Doctrine behind issuing the Monroe Doctrine had on lasting impacts on American foreign policy? Yes, Frederick Douglass was formerly enslaved. Um, I forget the semantics on how I forget exactly how he became a free man. I, it wasn't through marriage. I do believe either his master freedom or he got enough money to free himself. I'm not sure you'd have to look that one up, but 
he was a key figure and will off and will be mentioned on the exam. Like there's no way they don't mention him. Um, at least in one way or another. Um, oh, let's go through the answers for President Monroe for the Monroe Doctrine. So first off, the expansion of American territorial boundaries through wars with Europe. Uh, two B, sorry, the immediate disbandment of European European colonies. Oh, you said uh, already present the Americas, and Adam said D. It established America's longstanding policy of opposing European colonialism in Western Hemisphere. Let's see. Oh, oh, yours is a superstar. Um, so it was a cornerstone for U.S. foreign policy against e European interference in the Western Hemisphere and influences. Uh, it still influences American foreign policy today. And, but it didn't lead to immediate um, actions. Oh, the mechanical reaper. Nobody ever talks about the mechanical reaper, e including me, <laughs> including me. Um, how did Cyrus's McCormick's mechanical reaper influence future agricultural practices? Uh, cause a nation, did it cause a nationwide shift from agriculture to industrial occupations within a decade? Did it facilitate large-scale farming and set precedent for technological advancements in agriculture? Did it lead to an immediate end of small-scale scale farming across the country? Or did it prompt regulations limiting machinery used to protect manual labor jobs? The correct answer was B, that it didn't eliminate small farms overnight or cause a... It didn't cause an immediate occupational shift, but it did pave the way for more advanced technology and farming operations over time. And if you really want to get floppy with it, you could use that to say that it was the it was the makings of a small industrial movement within the United States way before the Industrial Revolution. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Oh, Henry Clay. Henry Clay is an important, Henry Clay is a strange historical figure. He's mentioned in like at least, what was it, like three of these units? Ran for president, didn't get it. Uh, the great, comp is he, who's the great compromiser? And how did his promotion of the American system influence states' economic policies? Uh, I'll give you some time to answer. Oh, you said C. It paved way for protective tariffs and federal spending on infrastructure projects, enhancing domestic economy growth. Ooh, all right. Oh, by the way, do you still want to go over Unit 6? Are there any specific, I'm sorry, not Unit 6, Unit 4? Are there any specific questions you have, like, about, um, what do you, about, like, the unit, maybe about some DBQ, like, SAQs, DBQs on the test? Because we could go over that as we go through it. Just something I'm putting out there. Also, for anyone joining us, we're just running through some practice questions. Um, if you're struggling in any unit, put it in the chat. We can go over stuff. We can go over those practice questions. You know, we're here to help you. So, but for now, we're just working through some unit four practices. So. We're going, oh yeah, we're going over unit four. And right now we're talking about um, how Thomas Jefferson's Embargo Act of 1807 shaped foreign policy in the long term. Please put your answers in the chat, A, B, C, or D, and we could see why the, why you were wrong or why you were right. I'm hoping we can go over why you're right. Um, <laughs> so did it highlight the complex interdependence between the U.S. economy and the international trade shaping future policies around this realization? Did it make the United States immune to foreign conflicts as it established total economic sufficiency? Uh, did it lead to a permanent hostility between Britain and France leading constant wars throughout history or result in complete isolationism as a core principle for all future American foreign policies? It was it was a uh, I didn't give you I didn't give you time to answer because I can go over the market revolution. Uh, I could go over the beginnings of it and how it. Do you have any specific questions on the market revolution? Because I could just I could go ham.
all of it. It looks like all a of it. Okay. overview. <laughs> So market revolution was between the 1740s and 1790s and the 1840s. So this was uh, this was before, I believe, the Industrial Revolution or right. It was happening right at the same time. It was a, like a transformation in how goods were not only produced, distributed and consumed. So if you want to think about the market revolution, think of these several key developments. First, uh, industrialization. It was a shift between agrarian so we have like the cash crop based societies and craft based economies to industrialize factory based production. And that was a big aspect of the market revolution. And this change was fueled by technological innovations like the cotton gin, the steam engine and machinery and other things, other machinery that in increased uh, efficiency in manufacturing. So on a DBQ, how would you use the market revolution as context? Because not really event or a period of time. Well, as I go through some of these, you could say that industrialization, you could say that um, the context that it was fueled in was an industrialized period. Um, there, Let me think about how you could connect that to any like change in time, probably uh, the, cha the shift from agrarian based, uh, agrarian based to industrialization oh and let me let me say another thing about the market revolution it was also it also changed our transportation infrastructure so we had the construction of canals uh roads and railways rail railways which provided it was a role in facilitating the movement of not only goods but people so think about so remember that the the market revolution um Adva the market revolution advanced helped facilitate the movement of goods and people because because of its construction of canals and roads so if you want to use an example of this it would be like the erie canal which connected the great lakes to the hudson river <laughs> the hudson river uh yeah no I'm, I'm sure about that there was also market oriented agriculture so it was not only was it a transition between agrarian based farming to industry industry, it was a transition from subsistence farming to like commercial agriculture. So in this time period, you see farmers beginning to focus more on producing goods for sale in distant markets, rather just for their own consumption or the communities around them. So the inventions like the mechanical reaper and the steel plow increased agriculture, agricultural efficiency. So you start to see an economic uh, a little bit of an economic boom around this time because of these new um, expansions. There was also, I'm forgetting one. Oh, expansion of markets, which led to transportation, advanced transportation, communication, and infrastructure. Uh, there was, I thought of it, I remember as like a CAT scan because I'm a Grey's Anatomy person. So C, communication, uh, a infrastructure and T for transportation. So this is this kind of goes into my previous point where we see a shift between subsistence farming to commercial agriculture. Like now we see farmers can even go to like it's not just your local farmers market you're selling at anymore. You're selling at places like basically like our Walmart. You can go from like like the bottom in the sticks in Louisiana all the way to New York. So not only do we see that, we also see national and international markets becoming more accessible. So we allow for increased trade and also specialization in what you do. Um, oh, let's talk about urbanization and the social changes around this time. So because, because of um, its new industry, we see the market revolution leading to the growth of cities and industrial centers. So we have factory work uh, attracting people from rural areas who wanted to who wanted to search for employment. So we have the beginnings of the we have the beginnings of a wage labor force. Um, we could you could connect the market revolution to the industrial revolution. Like ultimately, in my mind, they're not the same thing. Don't ever say they're the same thing, but they have the same you see patterns and what exactly happens between both of them. So if it makes it easier to remember the market revolution, the industrial revolution, you can connect the two because they had the, um, when we talk about them both, we talk about usually the same things. Um, oh, I wanted to go to social changes. So 
The shift from agrarian to agrarian and rural societies to industrial urban ones, um, we see the that traditional family and community structures were affected. Individuals increasingly moved to urban areas for work. Um, I do believe, I think someone, you'll have to fact check me on this. I'm going to have to go, like, I'm going to have to re revisit this question so I can go back. I'm pretty sure as a result of it, I'm, I'm not sure if this was the time period where women started going into work because we have traditional family structures where, like the women start women start going to work now, which um, goes against some of the um, previous social rules that were placed for women at the time. And then we also see market innovation, which is not which is isn't that important. We see entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs and in innovators, but that would could be more talked about when we talk about Henry Ford and all of that. So I wouldn't really focus on that. Uh, in summary, <laughs> so the market revolution contributed not only to economic both growth and technological progress, but it brought about, uh, we see social and economic, social changes and the beginnings of economic inequalities, um, which laid the groundwork for the later industrialization of the United States. I think I hit everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have historical document practice, like how you interpret? I don't specifically have practice, but I think uh, we could go over some tips on how you could analyze a DBQ. Yeah, we. I don't think we have specific practice questions, but I think overall tips. Is there anything you're struggling with specifically on the DBQ <coughs> or just like all of it, which is fair? Okay. okay, so we can, um, oh, Cosette, could you start off with some tips? Yeah. I, I, I didn't have, to, I don't think I had, I didn't have one on my exam. I don't oh, know. okay. Interesting. <laughs> um, that's, yeah. So DBQs, I, you're gonna, if you're taking AP classes, hopefully, I don't know if you've done one before, but they're in like most of your humanities based classes, um, for history. So it's like AP world, AP, like all of those have that. So it's hard. It took me a long time to learn, so it's, I'm spending too much time on them. Oh, okay. So in terms of understanding the documents, I also struggled with this because I didn't do a lot of historical readings. Um, and so it's like, it's challenging, right? Um, because again, we're not as familiar with how to interpret these texts and understand the main idea if it's something you're not familiar with. Hopefully by the time of the test, I strongly recommend, they give you like a list of documents you should know. I would familiarize yourself with the main arguments of each of these documents because there's a high chance that part of it could be in your DBQ and that'll help you right away, like understand what is going on. However, if that's not an option, like, you know, you can't memorize all of them or something else happens, I think the best ways to break down kind of a DBQ is my favorite strategies are to one, read the title, two, look at the time period because then you can use your context of what this time period a push is specifically trying to convey with the themes and then maybe trying to see if the author has a notable name, references another notable person in this time in history, try and contextualize the piece. I think those are things that really helped me if I had no clue. And then once I did that, understood the title, understood the context of the time period, understood the people, I think the two main biggest parts is like the usually the first paragraph and the last paragraph can give you some idea of what this document is even about. And so I would spend the most time on those, those paragraphs, at least for me, that's something I found successful. But if that doesn't work, again, if they aren't giving you the answers in the first and last paragraph, like those aren't helping you understand, go through and read it, but don't take up too much of your time. I think at the end of the day, if you can't get it, like it's not going to hurt your score tremendously. Um, I don't think I was the best at multiple choice or the DBQs and I still was able to get a five. Um, but again, just knowing how to get the points, you know, putting in that thesis, putting in like references to the documents, that outside knowledge and trying to make a cohesive understanding is really going to 
get you further than being able to really interpret and understand every single detail in the document, right? I think at the end of the day, it's like these teachers and you want to get the main points, but you don't have to be perfect um, because you're not going to be penalized for writing the wrong information. They don't like deduct points if you like do something wrong. You may not get like a complexity point or something like that, but they're not going to deduct points if you misinterpret one and then you just throw in like as much as you can. Is was That was my strategy. May not be the best one. Maybe Denial had different strategies to approach this exam, but we all learn differently. So I recommend practicing a lot and then you should be able to get a lot better. Uh, what I did for practice is, um, okay, first off, I want to go off of your little tip on looking at the documents that they already provide you with because nine times out of ten, they'll, they'll, Girls, actually, no, 10 times out of 10, they'll show up on the exam. So I know that you're given like either digital or like physical copies of books. I recommend leading like everybody skips these blurbs on the side every time they show an image or like they'll show you an entire paragraph, but you don't, you're not supposed to take notes on it. So you're going, so you're just going to rush through it. Those often, like I find those helpful because not only they, they show you exactly, they show you what documents are going to show up on the exam. Uh, that's one one that's one point I wanted to make. And two for practice. I remember when I was practicing for my DBQ. <clears throat> I again I practiced some I practiced I used the ones that College Board already provided for me. And I would go through, I would go through and try to write an introduction, a thesis, and three main points. And that's how I would practice, like trying to find out, try to figure out lightning fast what exactly I'm going to say. Um, also, if you're having trouble reading the documents um, and understanding what they are, I'm pretty sure they provide you not only, they provide you a blurb either on the bottom, the side, or the top about what time period this might come from or exactly who's speaking. If they don't, you could probably parcel it out because of the topics that they use. Um, I think that reading through all of the provided documents, being able to know the source, the content, con sorry, not content, <coughs> the source, the context, and especially when we're going through like speeches and things that aren't like, when you aren't given a graph, note the bias. Because um, a Henry Clay will be will have different biases than the Confederate general. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you'll have to take note of the biases and the author who's speaking it. And if you don't know, like, if you don't know what one document means, skip it and find skip it and find the next one because I'm sure you'll understand what the context is and what you're going to write about in a broader theme. Um, as you sift through the documents. Does that help? I hope that helps. Yeah, if you have more specific questions, just like put them in the chat. If not, I believe we can, I can actually see my chat at the moment going on here okay it seems like that was super helpful i'm glad we could help adam um yeah does anyone have any requests for any units to practice with multiple choice anything else you'd want to see at the end of the day we're here to help you we can talk about anything to be honest, to be honest. but but we can go back to practice right now Right now we're on unit, uh, we're doing unit four. We could go all the way up to unit five. Uh, we could go all the way up to unit five. I don't believe we've you've all studied unit six yet. I could be wrong. Uh, I don't think you would have gotten that far. Might be a little early. Yeah, let's stay on unit four and let's, let's stay, stick with the extra hard questions because it seems like those are the ones that gets, uh, what do you call it? It gets people's gears turning. So, ooh, okay. Uh, what was one long-term implication for Native Americans due to Andrew Jackson Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Act? Everyone's favorite president. Um, first off, the trail did the Trail of Tears, Tears result in a significant loss of life and cultural dislocation for many tribes. Um, B asked if the act led directly to full citizen 
citizenship rights granted to all Native Americans in recognition of their sovereignty. C asks if Native American nations successfully resisted relocation efforts by signing agreements with Congress. Congress and D, there were no major long-term implications as most tribes returned to the original homelands after some time. Oh, thank you for saying A, because there were definitely two of those that were very, very wrong. So it, Andrew Jackson, everyone's, I love Andrew Jackson. He's my favorite president. Um, they would, he would force tribes from their ancestral lands le leading to the Trail of Tears, where a thousands of lost lives in a relocation journey westward causing long lasting trauma among generations uh to come uh if we're asking I i'm gonna tie this back to dbqs uh if we all know that painting of the trail of tears that is that is an example of a document that the eight that ap loves to use that a that the ap exam loves to use so if you understand where that document comes from and you understand what it know what, what we're talking about then we could then you could uh, waffle out some ideas. Ooh, this question's interesting. How might the democratization of American politics have been impacted if Andrew Jackson had lost the presidential election in 1828? Now let's think about this because Andrew Jackson um, was like, I remember him in my head as he was the people's president. Not only the, uh, is it expand? What was it like? The voting rights expa expanded not not very far. It wasn't just land owning whites who could land owning whites who could vote for him. Now it's uh free white men <laughs> who could vote for him. I know what an expansion. <laughs> but um, if we're talking about democracy, there that's what that's what my mind immediately goes to. So let's let's go through the answers. So the expansion of slavery would have happened earlier. Um, less tension would have it, less tension would exist between the North and South. The slow pace of democratic reform may have continued, or Native Americans might not be forced to relocate. All right, Adam said D. Let's go for this. Um, D I would be incorrect because Native Americans, even before Andrew Jack Jackson, were still continuously being pushed off their land. Although Andrew Jackson was the president that got them to relocate, they Native Americans would have been forced to relocate either because of uh, uh, co set colonial settlements, not colonial, settler colonization. They would have been forced to be pushed off their borders anyway. Uh, or, yeah, they would have been forced. But before Andrew Jackson, uh, democracy, de democratic reform was very slow paced. Um, there were very little expansions of democracy. Uh, even there are very little expansions of democracy. So, and Andrew Jackson's presidency marked a significant shift between broader political participation and slowing down could have, uh, and him losing could have slowed down these reforms. That was a good question. I like that. Ooh, okay. The, how did the concept of manifest destiny contribute to the sectional tensions that led to the Civil War? The first one is religious conflicts regarding slavery morality. B, direct taxation disputes between the North and the South. Uh, C, expansion debates over new, sl new states' slave status. Or D, industrial differences between the North and South. So how did the concept of manifest destiny contribute to these sectional tensions? Let's get some answers in the chat. Mm. Oh, see. That's exactly what I was gonna say. So they were fuel that sectional tensions were like from the from Manifest Destiny and always going back to like the Louisiana Purchase. Um, they were always fueled by disagreements whether slavery should be allowed in these new territories that were required uh, as a result of Westward expansion. And again, all of these like this is like one point one, but all of these kind of snowball into the Civil War. Ooh, which post-colonial theory 
most directly applies to the Southern society's treatment of Native Americans during the antebellum period. <laughs> okay, um, ne first one, or we'll go through this slowly. Neocolonialism, which continued the influence of Native Americans over European settlers after gaining independence. Hybridity, which would be embracing European and Native Americans customs equally across Southern societies. It could be mimicry, which would be widespread adoption of Native American culture by settlers without any coercion or domination involved. Or Orientalism, which viewed Native American cultures as exotic, backwards, uncivilized, and at times dangerous. A, B, C, or D, because I'm I'm focusing on one specific answer. One specific answer really, like, uh, goes for me. Oh, you said D? That's what I was thinking. So it would be, the I was thinking neocolonialism at first, and then I read influence of Native Americans over European settlers. That doesn't really make sense. They didn't really have much of any influence. Now, you could argue, that could be an argument, that there was an adopt, like some adoption of their culture just because of how it all trickles down. But on a widespread scale, they were viewed as uncivilized, backwards, exotic, which, um, which was more of like a, which was a justification for why European media decided to sell. Ooh, okay. Ooh. So how did the market revolution shape gender roles in American society? I'm so glad I went over the market revolution just a minute ago. The market revolution limited opportunities for women in industrial jobs. Um, B, women were allowed to vote as a result of the market, market revolution. Uh, market revolution redefined uh, women's roles and led to the cult of domesticity. Uh, or it eliminated gender discrimination entirely. Well, we're glad we, you could come to the stream. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm you could watch us at any time, so don't don't be worried that you missed it. But I'm glad that you all that you came here. Uh, the market. I can already see B is incorrect. They were not allowed to vote as a result of the market revolution. You could make an argument. This this implies it was a direct result. You could make that argument that because women were allowed to have jobs, it led to them thinking, we can have jobs, maybe we can vote and have liberties. Uh, but the answer is C, that it redefined women's roles and led to the cult of domesticity, which was, uh, which because of the, I don't want to say deterioration of the family. God, I sound like Tucker Carlson. No, um, because the traditional fam familial roles were changing during this time because women can now take urban jobs in the city. So it, social expectations shifted towards endorsing women as homemakers and nurturers, which led to the cult of domesticity. Oh, God, utopian communities. They were... They were Okay, the utop it let the idea that the, the utopia was not really a utopia. They did not how to they did not know how to function. Uh, how would the development of the utopian communities like Brook Farm and New Harmony possibly be affected if they were not inspired by the principles of the Second Great Awakening? <laughs> That's a deep question. Oh, okay. I'm living for these questions. Um. It's got me to thinking. So, just to go over what the second great awake, the second great awakening, like let's let's try to go over it so at least we can parse our way through it. The second great awakening. I know the first great awakening was it. I think it was more of a the second great awakening, religious revival. Okay, the second great awakening was one of the religious revival movements that took place. Uh, in this time period, because because of it, it's it represented a sh significant shift in American religious culture, and it had a renewed emphasis on like social reform, like personal piety, 
like emo like more like emotional emotion more worship we see movements like transcendentalism that happened during this time because we see that industrialization is taking over society uh because we were led by the ideas of the enlightenment which put like more of an idea which put more of an emphasis on science and knowledge and less ideas on religion we see more of in a redu renewed religious enthusiasm which showed like a more of a personal and emotional connection with god so we see expression the expansion of christian evangelicals like uh the spread of like the spread of the gospel um i believe the social gospel was a t was a part of this movement where we have um where we have people preaching that we have to address social issues and improve society which led to reform movements the temperance movement abolitionism uh, and also women played a key role in these reform movements so you could say that they might not have existed or shared communal living or principles more working class individuals would participate in them you could say that such communities would focus more on industrial growth rather than social harmony or they could fossil capitalist attitudes instead of communal ones. I would love for someone to sound off in the chat about what they might think it is. Because I personally, I, uh, I personally am leaning towards C and um, A. Mm. Kosa, what are you thinking? I'm, I'm, kinda, I'm a little stumped. <laughs> I am also stumped because I think something I remembered, which is why it's like not adding up in my head, is that part of this second great awakening and effect was like in the idea of individualism and in religion. And so that's why I'm also <laughs> confused about like, because I think like, I guess it still would be applicable, the kind of shared communal living principles because they did have a lot of those principles that were relevant. But I think I'm leaning more towards C for that reason. Let's see. Okay. <gasps> okay. I can see why it's A because yeah. of the great, second great awakening, because even though it emphasized a personal and emotional relationship with, with God, um, because we see more of like a hippie, not hippie dippy. It was actually kind of nice. Um, like a more like, let's help others. Let's help our community. Uh, let's not be so focused on ourselves and capitalist attitudes. Let's go more for science and go for, for, for science. It's more like it helped, it put an emphasis on community in these utopian experiments. Um, and without the, the influences of the second great awakening, uh, I wouldn't say we I wouldn't say that the religion, I think capitalism and religion kind of worked not in tandem. They worked like they're again, they contrasted each other because they're more individualistic while religion more, more, more like Christianity, maybe focus more on community. So a would be a good answer. All right. I think about this all of the time. How might American culture develop differently if Manifest Destiny had it became a prevailing ideology in the mid 19th century? Hmm. Um, first, first um, answer would be European expansion may not have may have proceeded more slowly or not at all, potentially preserving more indigenous cultures and lands. We could say that Spanish as a second language could have been mandated for all citizens to facilitate communication with Mexico. That might, that's a, that's getting a little floppy with the answer if you ask me, but you could say that slavery would have ended sooner with no expansion of slave states westward or America could have become, became a monarchy similar to European countries. I think D, uh, he sounded off. I think D might be incorrect just a little bit. Not only because of uh, Americans, kind, American identity is kind of solidified within this, uh, within this era. I mean, you could say manifest destiny was a part of American identity. So, who knows? <laughs> but we did have a very anti-monarchy stance, even way, even now, even way back when. I'm leaning. If we could get someone to sound off the chat, that'd be great. But I'm leaning toward more towards A. 
oh my god it was like a russian roulette oh like the little the little dopamine rush i got from that so western expansion may not have taken so rapidly and would have limited the displacement of native american tribes it's more it's kind of speculative but it would be less yeah, because then we wouldn't have had the reason for Andrew Jackson to have the Trail of Tears because they wouldn't have to have pushed them off their land. Mm. After this, I think we could go to Unit 5. Actually, no, let's go to all the way to Question 10, and then we could go to Unit 5. Okay. Ooh. How has the Federalist Party's focus on strengthening federal authority and influence Amer modern American political structure? Oh, <laughs> I have a few ideas on this one, because when we think about uh, strengthening federal authority, I think this, I was originally going to say that maybe we wouldn't have developed a two party, like a solidified two party system. Well, let's, let's go through the answers. Um, it led to the permanent one party dominance in American politics. That's not true, because one party dominance, unless what I'm thinking of by one party dominance is that mean one party dominate all of American culture, or it could mean that only one party could dominate American politics, which would also be untrue because sometimes the house has been split. You can't really be dominant, but getting floppy with it there. It led to the abolition of state governments. Also not true. We still have state governments. Um, <laughs> we still have state governments. They weren't abolished. So that leaves C and D, where it created a system of direct democracy where citizens vote on all national issues or it laid the groundwork for strong centralized government that is still present today despite changes in political ideology over time. I'm just going to jump the gun here and say D, because, <laughs> because it form, Federalist Party formed the basis of America's modern political structure where even now when we're arguing for less government where people are arguing for less government overreach we still have a powerful central government to stand on uh Ooh, all right so our ninth oh, our penultimate question what long-term uh implications did harriet harriet beecher stowe's uncle tom's cabin have on the perception of slavery in northern states all right so if we need like a little little refresh on harry Beecher Stowe's uncle tom's cabin it's often lumped in together with frederick Douglass's autobiography where it it helped sentiments against slavery and saying it's amoral not amoral immoral 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 two different things um so i'm leaning towards b that it in that it resulted in widespread sim Oh, hold on. I almost read that wrong. I'm leading against B, where it, in it resulted in widespread sympathy for plantation owners and economic struggles. And it also did not lead to the immediate emancipation of slaves in southern states. Uh, this is this was way after the Civil War. Uh, it intensified anti-slavery sentiments and fueled the abolitionist movement in the North. This is not in the South. I'm pretty sure there were some opinions about Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin in the South where they're like, the, the novel makes us look bad. It's not that bad, you guys. We promise. We give them food sometimes and water. I swear, like, they're making us look bad. <laughs> That's a few, a few opinions were like that. So I just want to emphasize I was in northern states. Our ultimate question, which uh, which of the following foreign policies can be seen as a continuation of the Monroe Doctrine's approach towards European colonization efforts in America? This this actually could be a very good question if you really want to go into. Wait, do we don't we, they no longer have the complexity point, do they? They don't do have that. Do they? OK, I'm, I might be wrong. They have. I'm pretty sure, is it either easier to get the complexity point or they got it rid of it altogether? Oh, I think it's easier to get oh. all the points. They made it a lot easier than from previous, because I remember talking about this to someone and I was jealous. Yeah, because they had the Doomer, all the history teachers are going off. They had Doomer mindset, don't try it, don't do it, I swear. And they would like, they would like run their nails over chalkboards and start like crying in the middle of the class. Real, that happened to me. <laughs> Oh, all right. 
so Eisenhower doctrine. Ooh, what was the Eisen? Again, some of these. I'm not gonna lie to you. Weren't there like a good eight presidents that were like completely, <laughs> completely useless? That was during the age. I don't know if we're on that yet. <laughs> but um, ooh, Eisenhower. That was 1950s Cold War. The Eisenhower Doctrine was different than the Truman one. It focused, what was that one, the Middle East? Ooh. Middle East, yeah. Okay. It was communism based. But with the Monroe, it would be like, don't go. It would be more like against Europe. So we could yeah. say the Roosevelt Colorary. This also <laughs> known as like big stick diplomacy. I think that's what I learned it under first. They so. they love big stick diplomacy. That was the big <laughs> phrase. <laughs> I was like, I was like, because I, I when I saw this, I was like the Roosevelt color, and I was like, oh, that's yeah. big stick diplomacy. Exactly. Like when we think of the the expansionist presidents, or like, I'm sorry, the presidents that were, I guess we could call them expansionists. Yeah, Eisenhower wasn't not Eisenhower. Like Monroe was an expansionist. They were more like. He was like, don't step foot in American territory. We are America. We are greater than all of everyone else. And it's it didn't ne- it didn't even send shockwaves. As a matter of fact, they did not care. <laughs> but it, it mattered for us. It was important for us. They couldn't care less. But because they, they were both aimed at limiting European influence in the Americas, but their methods did vary. Ooh, Let's go I'll, on to Unit five, anyone who's new, we're doing practice questions and more. Engage in the chat if you can. We'd love to have you. Yes, please, because it it, it help. Also, if you have any uh, questions, because I did just go on a whole diatribe about the market revolution. And I know I look too happy for someone that has to talk about American policy. <laughs> but um, this is really my thing. So please, if you have any questions, any whatsoever, please sound off in the chat. All right, is this, uh, all right. Is this unit five, am I crazy? Maybe refresh it once. Yeah, let me refresh so we can make sure it's on the right unit. Yeah, see, that's better. Because I think it just needs to be refreshed. Yeah, because that was better because it was talking to me about manifest destiny. I'm like, oh, this <laughs> is that era. Um, ooh, this one. Oh, uh, this is what this is like. Part of my part of my minor. Oh, <laughs> what role did British attitudes towards slavery play in the failure of U.S. Reconstruction efforts? Ooh, let's go on a little. Let's go on a history lesson. Uh, all right. So one, the first a a says that british diplomatic interference undermined lincoln's presidency causing instability during reconstruction b that britain's informal support for confederate interests complicated union efforts during the war and the subsequent we recon- subsequent reconstruction we have c which britain's recognition of the confederacy as a sovereign nation drained union resources i'm going to say now i know for a fact that is incorrect I know for a fact C is incorrect because I remember that the Confederacy was trying to get Britain to recognize it as a sovereign nation. They didn't work. <laughs> it was more like they were they were talking in their ear, and as much like Britain during this time period, it was largely ignored. We thought we were bigger than everybody else, and nobody cared. And uh, D said the British abolitionist sentiment strengthened Northern resolve and led to harsher. Reconstruction measures against the South. I'm going to go on a limb here and say D is incorrect. And here's why. Because Reconstruction was a large failure, it was because it wasn't harsh enough. <laughs> it was because like African-American rights, maybe they were solidified in the right to vote, but a large a large part of why we see inequalities existing today with African-Americans was because of the failure of reconstruction, the failure to acknowledge not only their right for property, but also because we still have existing violence against um, African-Americans during this time period. So we could go either A or B. Was was it informal support for Confederate interests? Hmm. 
Ooh, A or B. You know what? Let, I, it's just time to get something incorrect. <laughs> All right. So it was, in fact, B, that Britain's informal support for Confederate interests, interests complicated Union efforts during the war and subsequent reconstruction. Because although Britain didn't directly intervene, it complicated the Civil War and Reconstruction because it provided a potential economic and political backing to the South. We all got that? All right. Hold on. What about you, four people who've been lurking this whole time? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm talking. Yeah, I'm talking to you directly. I, I don't go and don't go and put the tab on mute. Don't do that. <laughs> We're here doing these practice questions. We like for you to sound off in the chat. So if I would like for you to take that Domino's, what is it? What do you think fiveable people eat? Chick fil A. <laughs> like what? What, what is it? I know. Ooh. It's around, it's around that time. I know some of y'all got some dessert in your mouth. I know. <laughs> Gotta have it. Some banana pudding. But sound off in the chat. <laughs> what do you think about these extremely hard questions? Because they may, they may help you on some future SAQs or DBQs. Actually, let's not even go with the, it may help you impress your teacher. Try to get that A in the class. How many of y'all got missing assignments? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm out. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. What impact did the blockade runners, ooh, blockade runners, during the American Civil War, American Civil War had on international trade? Blockade runners, I'm pretty sure they were the ones setting fire to the South. They were letting it burn. They were saying it was nothing but scorched earth. Actually, that's what they called it. It was a scorched earth policy. Blockade runners. Yeah. So blockade runners ensured, did they ensure stable supply routes that kept foreign markets, um, foreign mark, f hold on. Oh my God. Blockade runners ensured stable supply routes that kept foreign markets unaffected. Did their activities have a negligible effect on tr global trade patterns or did they significantly disrupt exports from Southern states affecting European uh, textile trades negatively? Or did it do the opposite, where there was an increase in cotton, or there was a drastic increase in cotton prices, prompting Europe to invest more heavily into their colonies? Third, D is wrong because they did not have colonies at this time. <laughs> they were not. Uh, they had colonies, but they were not in America. Uh, Mr. Monroe made sure of that. Actually, he kind of made sure of that. I'm pretty sure it's C. All right, because they were the ones trying to disrupt cotton exports from the South because the South had money. <laughs> they had money from all those cash crops. They also had money, not only from cash crops, from the enslaved people that were working on them. So they were just, they were making money. So they had to disrupt all of, they had to disrupt all of that trade. It was a part of the Civil War tactics. Ooh, ooh. What might have been the impact if the Fugitive Slave Act, a component of the Compromise of 1850, was not passed? It could have been, I'm leaning towards this, this answer, that the Northern states could have become safe havens for escaped slaves and then escalated tensions between the North and South. Uh, and there's another answer that I think might have been more correct. It could have been the Texas and New Mexico's territorial dispute could have blown into a could have escalated into a full-blown conflict which was which is kind of related to escalating tensions i won't lie i'm gonna go for a what can i say what can i say i'm a whiz I cannot say. and it don't even matter anymore i don't get a grade for this <laughs> if only i were this if only i were this intelligent oh blockade runners um let me make sure i don't misspeak let me make sure I don't misspeak. Blockade runners. Uh, oh, right. They were the ones from they were the ones from the north that were trying to restrict the movement of goods and supplies to the Confederate ports because they were the ones that they were making sure that the, the South did not get supplies, weapons, ammunition, medicine, all, all those other goods to Confederate ports. And it also had another secondary, uh, it was it was also had like another secondary 
what it called purpose where it also stopped the confederates from getting money from selling all of their um, all of their goods into international markets good question thank you thank you all right what would have likely been the impact of morale on confederate troops had they won the battle of antietam now for those of you who aren't civil war whizzes which is most of you, which is most of you and me <laughs> i'm not gonna lie i'm i'm good on reconstruction not so good on civil war um god what was the battle of antietam was it Oh, it was the first, it was the first battle on the, the first, the Battle of Antietam was the first major battle that fought on Union soil. Was it the, was it the second bloodiest? No, Gettysburg wasn't even the first bloodiest. This was the bloodiest day because it yeah, caused, ca it was like most, basically casualties on both sides. Yep. All right. So now we know what the Confederate, if the Confederates had won the Battle of Antietam, what would have happened? One, it wouldn't have impacted morale because they're already motivated by their belief in the cause of preserving the institution of slavery. Oh, Adam is back. <laughs> oh, it's like Beyonce dropping her, her self-titled album, Beyonce, on a Friday and changing the, the landscape of music forever. It's just <laughs> like that. Um, B, it could have triggered more slave rebellions, fearing confederate victory and war uh winning it could have been that winning antietam wouldn't have changed anything as eventual defeat was inevitable or morale could have significantly improved possibly enough to prolong or sway the outcome favoring the confederacy first off winning saying winning a battle like even if you don't know the civil war saying winning a battle is not going to affect morale is crazy so a would be incorrect but they were dedicated in their belief in preserving the institution of slavery. Now, don't believe some of those Georgia textbooks. Mind you, my home state is Georgia. They used to have in textbooks <laughs> that, that they used to genuinely have this in textbooks where slavery was very benevolent and it was actually about states' rights. Gotta love it. Gotta love Georgia. Um, what are we, what um, answer choice are we? After we get, all, get rid of A, what answer choice are we going more towards? Could it have triggered more slave rebellions fearing Confederate victory? It might have. But at that point, either like slaves were either being forced to fight for the Confederacy or they were either fleeing to other parts or they were fighting for the North. So it could have very well did it. Winning Antietam wouldn't change anything. No, I'm going to go with morale could significantly improve. Because, like, not not to, hate, not to break it to you. Not to break it to you. Um, which is crucial. During the war, winning the Battle of Antietam would have had, winning a battle would have had positive impact of Confederate forces. It likely, if you really want to get floppy with it, it really could have extended on the impact. Not, I'm sorry, extended the war. God forbid, it might have led to them winning. Though I, I don't entirely believe that. Next question. We could go through at least 10 of these and then we could backtrack to other units. Like we, could, we haven't gone through unit three, I don't think. So we could finish like the five of these because we still have what, like 30 minutes? We could, we could finish five of these and then we could go back to uh, unit three. As if you're not knowledgeable on Unit Five, that's okay. Uh, most most of y'all won't make it to the modern era. <laughs> we won't make it to then. <laughs> that's not a joke. <laughs> okay. Through a feminist lens, let's lock in. Uh, how might gender roles have played a part in exacerbating conflicts during this time period? Now we're talking about the time period of Civil War and Reconstruction. Now we cannot say that because feminism did not exist during this era, it would have had no effect on these events. We can't say that because the because not only we we had Sojourner Truth's "Ain't I a Woman" speech, 
which was one of the markers of modern feminist intersectionality. We also had the market revolution, and we also see saw because of this uh, a, like a reverse reaction that women need to get back into their homes and we need to have a cult of domesticity. So we can't say it had no effect. And we can't say because women were excluded from politics, they had no influence on conflicts. Because we also saw during the American Revolution, women played a significant role in, uh, women played a significant role in helping, um, I was gonna say the union, and helping the, whoop, 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 and helping the colonies. We could, while we're going through A and D, we could sound off in the chat, uh, which answer we might think is right. We could say that women's roles as moral competences, competences increased pressure on men to resolve the issue of slavery, or D, women actively promoted sectional division to obtain more rights for themselves. Hmm. D, I'm thinking, mm, I'm, D, I'm a little iffy on. Because it was true, a lot of feminist scholars during this time were th saying that, well, if we get rights for African Americans, that means we could get rights for women. It was also a very racist argument that they used to build off of that. It was also very racist that, well, it, it, it was very racist. So, you're gonna guess B. Oh, it looks like your guess was right. I know like that little a little rush of a general adrenaline when you're right. Because women had a cultural expectation of moral guides, I uh, could have uh, added further pressure on male politicians to resolve slavery exacerbating conflict. Oh, is so somebody knows ha has that much knowledge on unit 5? Let me just go back to what was it? Unit 3. We're talking about Please, is this the enlightenment one? Ah! Now, as an aspiring philosophy minor, I really love the enlightenment. John Locke, <laughs> the social contract, love all that. All right, first question. I'm gonna start off with a few extremely hard ones and then I can go into medium so we can get like more of a general feel on that. Right, let's, let's start off with three of these. So what would have been the impact of US politics if Benjamin Franklin's proposal for executive council instead of a single president wasn't, was accepted. Let's think about that. We could say the ex executive branch may have less centralized power. I don't think women would have attained suffrage sooner because again, these were all white land, land owning? No, 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 they were all white land owning men. Or were they? I think majority. The majority, yeah. We couldn't say that Native Americans would have retained more land rights. The Civil War may never happen. Huh. Huh. I'm, I'm leaning towards A and D. And so, like, if we could sound off, A, we could sound off between, you don't have to pick A or D. Like, sound off what you think is right, and then we could go over it. Because, again, these are questions that are meant to fuel more like uh more like when we're going for causation, connection, uh, change, like the three C's, these are what these questions are useful for. And if you'd like to practice this at home, we have the, we have put the uh, link on, is it on the screen? Uh, currently, I can't, I'm, I'm on a different screen, so I can't tell. Oh, it's um, in the chat. I can re-put them in the chat for you guys. Yes, please, because if you want to practice this on your own, we can go. Oh. All right, so D is incorrect. That the explanation for that is that Franklin's proposal aimed at distributing less executive power. Had it been accepted, the executive powers, so like the like top the top of the branch, might have been less concentrated that than now. And I and it also says that it wouldn't directly influence women's suffrage, civil war, or native land rights. That makes oh, sense. she's on my shirt. Oh, bro said, oh, I'm not sure <laughs> after I answered it. <laughs> I know the pain must have been real. <laughs> All right. What role did the outcomes of the Seven Years' War, this is the war nobody remembers, play in shaping social attitudes towards Native Americans that exist, persist today? 
I'm pretty the Seven Years War was between Britain and France, right? Yeah. Yep. It I mean like if you want to get floppy with it, it was the first world war. <laughs> it was the first world war. Like yeah. some, some some historians really do consider consider it that way. Oh yeah, because like, Spain and other places. Yeah. So it was it was fraught primarily between the British and the French colonial forces with Native American allies on both sides. Uh, and it ended in the Treaty of Paris and the Seven Years War set the stage for subsequent conflicts like the American Revolutionary War and the Napoleonic Wars as well. Uh, we're talking about Napoleonic Wars. We're getting a little a AP world territory, but Napoleon did play a factor in some parts of American history, i.e. Louisiana Purchase. Also, if we want to we want to get real, want to do a real deep cut, uh, it was when we we're asking to give allyship to France in uh, the Napoleonic Wars. Also, after the Seven Years' War, um, Britain was flat broke. <laughs> that's why we. That's why they needed money from the colonies, which led to the American Revolution. So. When we're asking what how, what role it played in shaping social outcomes, we have A, it made Native Americans a prominent part in crafting a U.S. Constitution. Now, we could just put on our critical thinking caps. <laughs> if we could just, if we could just think, not even critical thinking, thinking caps, a cap. Are the Native Americans, were the Native Americans in the room with them at this moment? Okay, we could cross off A. Um... It resulted in the mass, it could result in the mass conversion of Native Americans to Christianity. I I don't believe that is exactly true. We were gonna convert them anyway. We we're gonna convert and subjugate because of it. We were gonna convert and subjugate anyway because of expansion. And our conversion was more of our, uh, it wasn't exactly for the purpose of conversion. It was mainly for conquest. Um, See, it led directly to the creation of reservation systems implanted later by the U.S. government. Or D, in, enforce a European view of indigenous people as military allies or enemies rather than independent nations. Oh, somebody said A. Oh, <laughs> you were you were joking. <laughs> my fault, my fault. But I was gonna say D. That if we're paying it, if we're really paying attention to the patterns in the history. Um, indigenous people were never really saw saw as independent nations. It was only until God, it was one of the court trials where a Native Americans were saw, seen as independent nations. Even then, we are more like as people we could push out and people that could either help or harm us. They are more strategic pawns than actual enemy. They're actual people with autonomy. So that led to uh, long-term consequences on their treatment uh, in the even existing today. Ooh, what what global effect resulted from the British decisions to enact stricter laws on the American colonies? All right, let's go through the answers because I could go on a little diatribe about how the American Revolution was it. I'm sorry, I was wrong. It was the French Revolution that's by the American Revolution, which inspired the Haitian Revolution, which inspired Latin American revolutions. It was a lot, it was a revolutionary era. But um, first, we're go I'm gonna go through the answer choices now. First one, countries like France decided to tax their own citizens more heavily as a preemptive measure uh, against revolution. I'm seeing already an answer for D, which is the Dutch, Republic implemented similar stringent tax laws on its South African colonies with no violent resistance or consequence. Let's go with D. All right. So I can explain why D isn't correct because they didn't implement these, they, the Dutch Republic and its colonization of South Africa, they never got, they got met with resistance and it did have consequence. And it was with consequence. So the correct answer would be C, that European powers recognized potential unrest in their own colonies and sought proactive uh, reform. After they saw, after the, 
after the strict British tax laws that mapped in American colonies and triggered revolution, it led other European powers to realize the potential of unrest in their own colonies and then push for reforms. Oh, which philosopher? Again, you will be you will be asked to remember philosophers uh, was most influential in shaping Thomas Jefferson's drafting of the Declaration of Independence. So which philosopher had the um, idea, not states' rights, what am I talking about? Uh, of the social contract of rights, of your of personal rights and liberties? Like, let's, let's sound off in the chat. Karl Marx did not exist. Um, hold on, let me back check that. Let me back check when he was born. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Karl Marx did not exist at this time. And Nietzsche, which <laughs> is ingrained into my brain because I incorrectly cited his date of birth on an essay. It was a bad time for me. Because people are saying John Locke. Boom. So John Locke, love him, uh, love him to death, um, has his ideas of natural rights, liberty, and property, which Jefferson borrowed for the Declaration of Independence. So this is going to be our fifth and not final practice question, but our final extremely hard question. So we can get into more like general knowledge. Like I think I'm, I think I put the fire under you for a little too long, a little too long. I'm going to put it down to a simmer. Ooh. Are, are we sure this is? This is not unit three. This is not unit three in Vietnam. My fault, you guys. This is not. <laughs> This is not what we're talking about. All right. How did the outcome of the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, indirectly impact industrialization in America? One, uh, please sound off with answers in the chat. Also, letting y'all know, uh, please ask ask us questions because we are nearing uh, we are nearing like the four, uh, hour forty minute mark. So I'd like to get some Q and A in. If you have any specific questions, uh, Vietnam was a mistake. All right, wait. Vietnam was not a mistake. The Vietnam was <laughs> <another context. laughs> but, but the question was a mistake. My fault. <laughs> Don't clip that. Um, <laughs> a with Britain's debt increasing due to war expenses, colonial taxes raised, leading to unrest that resulted in revolution, creating a new nation ready for uh, industrial growth. You could say led, I'm already leaning towards A because I kind of I kind of summarizes my whole thoughts on the Seven Years War, French and Indian War, if you don't know. Uh, it could be that French, French's loss enabled America to gain Louisiana territory where other influence where other industries flourished. And someone said, hey, and you were correct. I would I would advise you to remember that tra that chain of events, that Britain's debt increasing due to war expenses and the colonial taxes to unrest led to revolution, which led to the nation ready for industrial growth. You could also use that same pattern of thought for everything else when we're talking about uh, American growth and America developing its own national identity. I get a lot of questions actually about, like now I'm noticing a pattern about how America developed its own national identity. And it was specifically because of the lack of, before salutary neglect, America was living it, the colonies at this point, American colonies were kind of living it up. Uh, like we were free. We had a whole frontier we can explore. We also were established on the ideas of religious freedom and freedom from persecution. And they also brought with them like, and, and we also brought, it wasn't like the first cultural melting pot. Like how hard is it to have like the different cultures of Europe? Be so serious. <laughs> but um, we had a bunch of different people living, trying to live and vie with one another. So we had ideas of freedom already built in. And then moving on, uh, we also, what else what I'm trying to get? After salutary neglect was lifted, we were like, what, Where? where's our freedom? And then we started to establish a lot of it. But if we're talking about freedom, uh, American identity before this period, um, it was largely based, we kind of got everything from Britain. 
Like, no hate. <laughs> we kind of we kind of ripped everything from Britain until um until like a few until very much a few years after the American Revolution. I'd argue it was this the the eras leading up to civil war and reconstruction. That's what gave us our national identity. Okay. Uh which principle of government exhibited continuity throughout the early republic period? Was that a recent answer? C. Oh, oh, thank you. Feudalism is long gone. Communism doesn't communism isn't here anymore. We were against absolute monarchy. So remember that uh, federalism is a, a continuity. We're talking about this. There's three C's. How did Washington's farewell address influence American foreign policy? Pushing for colonial expansion into Asia and Africa by promoting trade sanctions against rival nations, advocating for neutrality in international conflicts, or encouraging military alliances with European powers. Sound off. Mm. We're seeing C's. Oh, I'm seeing C's. My camera is off. All right. So it was indeed C because if anybody, let me, I'm going to stop mentioning Hamilton this for it before we get, before I get shot. Um, Washington's farewell address was his advice to stay away from national, from a foreign policy. And we obeyed that for a time. What was a significant impact of the Louisiana purchase from 1803? The Louisiana Purchase. Let's see. Let's think about that. What did the Louisiana Purchase do? I wonder. Please get this question. <laughs> I beg you. Doubled the size of the United States, led to the War of 1812, resulted in the Civil War, or it tri triggered Manifest Destiny. Now, a lot of these are correct. A lot of these are actually correct, but there is one correct answer. Double the size of the United States. Now, the Louisiana Purchase did double the land of the land area, which set the stage for westward expansion. But the Louisiana Purchase did not directly trigger manifest destiny. It would you would have to put at least a few more steps in there before we get to that. I mean, yeah, it technically did all of them. Technically, it did all of them, but it did not directly do all of them. It's like, it's the difference between pushing somebody down the stairs and telling somebody to push someone down the stairs. Either way, they get pushed down the stairs, but your culpability and in, in your culpability is questionable in both of them. That was a weird metaphor. Um, <laughs> Which principle persisted throughout the American Revolution and remained a core value in America's political identity? The belief in representative democracy, the divine right of kings, military dictatorship, or royal absolutism? Now, we all know America. We all love our kings. Famously, America has loved kings and royalty and absolute leadership and dictatorship thank you all for giving that right remember this um this could be classified as a continuity we all a belief that has existed throughout the american revolution and leading into uh as we develop our own political identity now i'm sorry as we develop our own government but belief in representative democracy has always been there what clause and the Articles of Confederation made it difficult for Congress to levy and collect taxes, consequently leading to financial instability. Um, unanimous consent required for the amendments. Oh, is that a new one? Oh, uh, no, it's not. Let me pay attention. Um, state sovereignty over all powers, not specifically assigned to Congress. The one vote per state, regardless size or population, or lack of a national judiciary. Judiciary. I'm seeing another A. Seeing another A. 
Easy A. Um, no Emma Stone. Uh, the fact that unanimous consent, what it was unanimous consent that we everybody had to agree on one thing. And if there's one thing you know about America, this is not on the this is not on the test, but I would consider it a continuity. We can't agree on anything. <laughs> oh, which event most directly led to the writing of Common Sense by Thomas Paine? Signing of the Treaty of Paris the battles of Lexington and Concord, the Boston Tea Party, or the French and Indian War? Which event most directly led, I wanna, I wanna emphasize, directly led to the writing of Common Sense by Thomas Paine? Let's sound off. I could already tell you, I'm pretty sure D is incorrect. Now, I'm a history whiz. I'm not a chronology whiz, but the French and Indian War happened before Common Sense. Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense, so we can kick that off. Battles of Lexington and Concord happened after the Common Sense. So, feasibly, <laughs> okay. At five of all here, we're all learning. As I said, I'm not a chronology expert. I also thought it was the Boston Tea Party. So that is. Because I assumed it was um, the Stamp Act, the massacre, and then the Boston Tea Party, and like kind of like leading to this. I guess because those those weren't the first battles of the American Revolution, if I remember correctly, and apparently I don't. Um, it was the battles of Lexington Concord, which prompted a uh, Thomas Paine to write Common Sense. Oh right, because the Lexington and Concord, they were they were like fighting in the square. There's Again, if we want to go back to DBQs, there's a famous painting of it, a uh, painting etching where they paint, they paint it. No, that's a Boston massacre. Oh God. But there's probably, an, there's probably another document exactly like that. Oh wait, yeah. Okay. I just looked it up. Yeah. Common sense several months after the battle. So makes <sighs> sense. Oh, uh, now I'm hating. <laughs> now I'm mad. Oh okay. yeah. Right. Adam is correct. Slay. <laughs> like massive slay oh which of these was a sticking point for racial equality that persisted before and after the civil war voting rights segregation laws fair employment practices or the abolition of slavery now mind you when we're saying before and after slavery i guess you could argue that they had segregation laws but it's not really a segregation law if person isn't recognized as a personhood to begin with. So segregation laws is already out. Uh, the abolition of slavery is something that could have been a potential sticking point for racial equality. Because you can't have racial equality if a person isn't recogni is recognized not as a person, but as property. Fair employment practices, <laughs> in, in, some, in some sick, twisted way. You could say it was fair employment practices <laughs> in some sick way. Um, voting rights, maybe. A, B, probably A, B, or C, but A, probably. Let's just go with A. My eye is twitching. <laughs> <laughs> I get, I, I will contest that. I will contest that till the end of the sun, but the racial segregation laws remain persistent even after abolition of slavery, post-Civil War inequality among races. Oh, I see. It was a problem with my reading of the, of the answer. That the abolition of slavery wasn't a sticking point after the Civil War because slavery was already abolished. All right. Okay. Segregation laws... I don't know how the segregation laws persisted before because they weren't exactly segregation laws. It's hard. I mean, technically, technically segregation laws, but they weren't exactly called segregation beforehand. That's something that was coined after Reconstruction. Okay. Uh, why did Native American tribes align with the French during the Seven Years' War? Because was it because the tribe had better, better trade relations with the French and the English settlers? Was it because the French promised them independence after winning the war? Or was it the tribes were forced into alliance by the superior military power of France? 
or the native tribes share religious beliefs with the French. Oh, okay. I think this is a good point to talk about the differences between the how the French treated Native Americans, how the English treated Native Americans, because I think that's something that they will ask you about. Um, ooh, let me go into my notes. <laughs> ah, I was waiting on this. Anybody have an answer? Ooh, let's just go with A, for, first of all. Because historically, Native Americans all maintain beneficial tra fur trading relationships with the French, which influenced their alliances during this conflict. Um, I think this is where this is not exactly a point where they differ. They did have trade relations. They just ultimately had more favorable trade relations with the French, as favorable as you could get. Um, how did westward expansion under manifest destiny affect native populations during the early Republic period? I know early Republic period is a little confusing. It's before it is the well they're fledgling little the chick baby nations and we're, we're just a little baby nation that is early republic late republic what would late republic be would probably be before the civil war that's that's late republic uh it forced in relocations and loss of native land it contributed to an increase in population due to improved living conditions. For whom? <laughs> living conditions for whom? Uh, also, mind you, um, America was actually no, that's a tangent. They were just we were dirty back then. We were just dirty. Oh my god, no bathtub. Oh my god, it was disgusting. But as settlers moved westward under manifest destiny in this era. Native Americans were forcibly, forcibly relocated during this ancestral lands, causing uh, loss of life and then continuing hardship. This unfortunately will be a, con a continuity among like, always we give no Native Americans a short end of the stick, even continuing to today, as in today, December 5th. Um, woo. Yeah, American Revolution. American history is not happy. If, if you're looking for a happy subject to study, go into ag go into botany. <laughs> go to AV botany. This is not it. Um, in what way did Chief Justice John Marshall's rulings impact federal state relations during this period? He ruled that states had no authority in any matter involving the federal government. Were that was that his conditions his decisions were consistently upheld federal authority over states' laws when they came into conflict? Did they strengthen the individual power, individual states' power over federal law? Or did it lead to a decrease in both federal and state governments? Bye, Adam. Thank you for coming twice. We have seven people. This is literally, oh, I'm seeing people in the chat. Oh my God. Hmm. Chief Justice John Marshall, please, anyone answer this question. Sound off. You guys got this. Put it in the chat. Hello, what's up? We're answering practice questions. Put your answer in the chat. And we're just having a good old time. If you want to do more A push practice, I recommend we're doing um we're doing the little, these little practice and Q&A sections all through, like, we have it scheduled all through three, all through three weeks. So please come to the next one if you missed, if you came in at the tail end. If you came in at the tail end and you still have questions. Yeah, for sure. All right. You said B or C. Let's or, flip a coin. Oh, wait, A. Okay. So Ola is between. Oh, wait, A. <laughs> oh, you should have went with your gut. <laughs> That's also a tip I have for the exam go with your gut because often more often than not you're you know what you want it you know what you're doing so john marshall um also we also we could go into the midnight judges that was whew, what a what a time that was um delivered rulings that upheld federal supremacy upheld that means federal supremacy when state and federal laws were at odds so 
It established the precedence of federal law over state law, and it strengthened national unity. Yeah, McCulloch versus Maryland. I think this also because wasn't he? I'm pretty sure he was a federalist. That's why. That's why he did this. So yeah. we have partially him to thank for our uh, strong central. We have our strong federal government. What compromise during the Constitutional Convention led to resulted in a bicameral legislature? Let me define that for you. <laughs> let me let me get my handy let me get my handy dandy dictionary and define that. Bicameral. Oh, a legislative body having two chambers, not one, but two chambers or two branches so when we think about this it's like the how our how a bill becomes a law <laughs> how our how our branches go into it so which compromise we had the commerce and slave trade compromise uh well is that an answer to this question i'm unsure i'm pretty sure it is because it says 55 you said blah, 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 b i think yeah it is the Great Compromise. Oh, I'm so proud. I feel like, oh, my heart goes a flutter. Um, so it resulted the creation of a two house Congress to appease both the small and large states. Not to be confused with the other Great Compromise that we'll get into in this after, no, before the Civil War. A lot of compromises. <laughs> Most of our government, all we do is compromise. That's why nothing gets done. Um, anyway, how did the outcomes of the Treaty of Paris affect Spanish influence in North America? A, Spain fully withdrew from North America following the terms set out by the treaty. Or did the Spanish influence increase due to Spain getting former French territories lost in war? Or was it reduced because of acquisitions made by Britain after defeating France? Or D, Spain took over all of the remaining Native American lands post-war conclusion. Now, outcomes of the Treaty of Paris affecting Spanish influence. It was C. All right. So, uh, with France's defeat, that's the ex explanation, says Britain gained key territories, including Florida, which had already been under con Spanish control, which reduced Spanish influence within North America. Ooh, we're at 8.57. We have, uh, let's see if we can get all 15 of these. I hope to see you all again, but I'll save that for the goodbyes. Uh, what is the continuous characteristic of political debates in the early years of the Republic? Free trade agreements with uh, foreign nations. We have the power balance between federal government and individual states. Legalizing child labor or women's suffrage issues. Now I just want to go off of C. Child labor was already legal. <laughs> we had children working everywhere. So C, I'm just going to go off the bat and say it was incorrect. Unless you were like a real, a real liberal in this time. Which I guess liberal in this time would have meant the opposite. But, <laughs> um... Free trade agreements are free trade agreements, the power balance or women's suffrage issues. Sound off. Also, I want to say that D is incorrect because I'm no hate. Um, nobody cared. <laughs> no politician cared about women in this time period. If you were up there talking about women's suffrage issues, you would have you would have been tarred and feathered in the town square. Not historical. That wasn't historical, but um, just use that to emphasize my point. We said B, which thank you. As we see, this is this is a question that kind of goes off, that goes on like one of the key um points of like if you remember nothing about this, please remember the big concept as we're trying to vie between what federal and what federal the powers between federal and individual states. We also see rights and individual liberties. Uh, this is like a time of revolution and republic. All right. We're at the penultimate question. What historical situation influenced jo George Washington's farewell address warning against political parties and foreign alliances? 
I would personally like to go, uh, not go, oh my God. I want to say that the creation of the Bill of Rights, that was long, that was long before, before, so it wouldn't have influenced his farewell address. United States Constitution was already ratified. So we have, and the signing of the Declaration of Independence happened way before. So it was B, where that political factions could have potential pitfalls that uh, would allow for not only sectional divisions, which he was right about, but foreign divisions. And that would be time. That is our time for now. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for, thank you for all of this. <coughs> I enjoy this. I hope you got a lot out of it. We will be doing more A push prep and prep, prep and pack practice. So stay tuned for the upcoming weeks. Um, if you'd like to practice on your own, please use the link below uh, and we can go off. Thank you. Cosette, if you'd like to say anything with goodbyes. Yeah, goodbye, everyone. Make sure you do your practice. And we have these streams all week for the next three weeks. So make sure you stay tuned for whatever you need help with. We love y'all. See you all very soon.